Hello there, my name is Patrick Denny and welcome to this presentation about Colchester at war and particularly life on the home front during the period 1939 to 1945. I should also mention that this is the, the second of my Colchester at War videos and it follows on from a similar title which was Childhood Memories of Colchester at War. But this is really an extended version if you like and although it does include some of the material seen in the earlier video quite a bit more has been added here. So what was actually happening on the home front? Well we know that you know tens of thousands of men and women signed up for the armed forces and probably spent most of their war years actually out of the country but the vast majority of the population stayed at home and collectively did what they could to help keep the country safe, um, helping out with such, such things as food production, recycling of waste, working in the factories to produce munitions, and, and generally helping um, to prepare for the defence of the country if needed, and of course so much more. But shall we get started and we'll move on to my first slide. Okay. So this is one of those pivotal days, Sunday 3rd of September 1939, Britain declares war on Germany. This is one of those days, I, I don't think anyone in the audience was actually there, but if you was actually there, it's one of those days where you knew exactly where you were when this event happened. It's much the same in later years, if some of you may remember possibly where you were or what you were doing when you heard that President Kennedy had been shot, for example. Or later on, when you heard that Princess Diana had been killed in that terrible accident. It's one of those, you know, it's sort of etched on your memory. And we're going to start off just by looking at a couple of people's memories um, of what they remember about war being declared. And we're going to start with a blue badge tour guide that was. This is Olive Hazel. Some of you may have remembered Olive Hazel. Sadly, Olive passed away a couple of years back. But it was Olive who inspired me to become a guide um, all those many years ago. But um, Olive could remember, like many people, as you can see in this illustration, her family sitting around the radio just after 11 o'clock on Sunday morning of that day, um, waiting for the broadcast, which was expected to come on the radio. Um, and then they heard the, the words of Neville Chamberlain. I am speaking to you from the cabinet room at 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now, that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. Well, should we just have a look at what Olive had to say about that event? I'll read it through, but you can follow it yourself. I can remember the Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain coming on the radio about 11 o'clock on Sunday, 3rd of September 1939 to announce that this country is now at war with Germany. As I sat with my parents, my grown-up brother and sister, and one of my uncles in the kitchen of our house, I had no idea at nine years old what it all meant. When bedtime came that day, I found that my parents had moved my bed into their room. During the first few weeks of the war, families had been evacuated from the east end of London into Essex, and we had a mother and a little boy billeted with us. They were very bored in the country and only stayed for about two weeks, which was probably just as well for my father's blood pressure, as the first thing that the little boy had done after arriving was to pull every head from every flower in the garden, which was my father's pride and joy. Just imagine that. And also, I just want to share memories of um, a lady called Nora Frost, who we interviewed some years ago. Nora was born in 1919 and she went on to become a, a teacher in Colchester and we'll hear a bit more about her um, later on. But she, she said, my mother and I were in the dining room listening to Chamberlain. I think we were both tearful and my father came in and said, come on, there are things to do. We've got to get the cellar ready. I said, I'm not going down in that cellar. 
he said, look, we'll put some deck chairs down there and a bit of carpet. He'd got a big shovel and a broom handle. And I said, what are you going to do with that? He said, put this shovel on the broom handle and you come in behind me in case we get any incendiaries. I said, Daddy, I'm terrified of fire. Are you going to let me do it alone? He said, no, no. Little did I know then that within six months he would be dead and I would be doing it alone. Gas masks were one of the first things that were issued to the population. In fact, they started issuing these gas masks as early as 1938. And by the outbreak of war, I, I suspect that most people had been issued one. And one of the reasons why they thought this was important, because this was still only about 20 years or so after the First World War, when they know that the, the enemy um, used poison gas and many soldiers uh, you know, were poisoned in the trenches and came home suffering. So they, what they thought was, if this country is going to be invaded, one of the first things that Hitler's going to do is drop poison gas down. Um, as it turned out, he didn't and they were never needed, but they weren't to know that. And um, you'll see on the left hand side, one of the wartime posters. Now, there was dozens and dozens of these posters advertised. Hitler will send no warning. So always carry your gas mask. And in fact, it, it was a, you know, a, a legal requirement. You, you had to carry your gas mask. And um, but they also issued, uh, you can see an example of from Will cigarettes, cigarette cards. There was a whole series of, of um, home guard type things like how to put your face mask on, how to operate a stirrup pump and so on and so forth. Um, for the very babies, the, 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 the little toddlers, um, they had this, you can see depicted here, this complete enclosed gas mask with they put the baby actually inside, tied it all up and then they would like pump air into it. Um, and then on the bottom right, we've, we've got the so-called Mickey Mouse gas mask which was for the children. But you know, it, it wasn't only um, men, women and children who wore gas masks. Some animals also were fitted with gas masks. I don't know whether you were aware of this, but horses. Um, here we've got a horse fitted with gas mask. And of course, in the First World War, horses also suffered from gas um, in the trench warfare. Another thing that um, became operational was a, an order right from the start of war throughout the whole period was an enforced nighttime blackout. Again, lessons learned from the First World War. What they didn't want, of course, was for planes flying across from the channel to actually see all the lights and see where the houses are. There was cases in the First World War where enemy planes had come over and they could they could see all that they could see where the coast was because they could see all the lines of houses with all their lights on, and what they would all often do is follow the trains. So they they see the fire on the trains and they would follow them till they got into the goods yards and then drop their bombs. So anyway, lessons learned. So there was a very strict blackout imposed. People could actually be sent to prison, but I mean or, or fined heavily. So all windows had to be completely blacked out. For shopkeepers, for example, they used to have a double doorway. So you would go from the outside into one little area, there'd be a curtain across, you'd close the door, then open the curtain and then go through. Motorists had to have special um, filters fitted on their headlights uh, and so on and so forth. But that was terrible and it was, you know, it was really dark. People, had, in the first few months of the war, there were so many accidents people literally walking into each other, walking into lampposts, tripping over curbs, falling into canals, all sorts of terrible things, but it's pitch black. Now, I know we don't really experience it too much today, but I don't know about you, but I can remember a few years ago, my family and I went to Fingringhoe um, for a, a concert or something they were putting on down there. And we, it was in the winter time, and we came out and it was it must have been a, a cloudy evening and there's no street lamps or anything on and it was actually pitch black and i remember feeling quite fr not frightened but very wary because you couldn't actually see the road in front of you and you're walking along with your hands out um so imagine putting up with that for six years almost uh well six years um throughout this period but that was one thing that everybody had to put up with 
here we've got a view of um i mean to start with people put their own blackings up if you had some old dark material you could put up but as time went on um, the government provided proper blackout material that you could purchase for you know um threatens a yard or whatever the case may be and many people have told me that what their father did they made up a, a special frame uh, to fit the size of each window and then they would fit the black up black up material onto this frame so they could be lifted on and off every day it had to do this every day every window in the house um, some of them if they were not needed they probably left them in place but if not they had to be taken down so you've got daylight um, during the day um, John Hedges who lived in Speedwell Road at Old Heath he told me this we had to black out very strictly at the time we had an air raid warden living opposite named Bill Scrutton I'm sure people remember him he was a small man but he made himself heard he would come rattling very hard on your front door and would tell you in no uncertain terms to cover up every crack in your windows because some light was showing and I've heard this you know numerous times that many of these ARP wardens um you know they had a bit of authority if you like and they weren't frightened to use it at the time um but of course it, as i said it, it was very dark and it, you know another illustration that i remembered was told to me by emily doldry who born in 1907 so she'd lived through two world wars and she said my husband worked at paxman's and he had to do his turn on fire watching duty his only problem was that he only had one good eye and he couldn't see very well in the dark so i had to take him down to get his helmet and show him where to go and on his way back if it was still dark he had to count the trees in the road to find his way home he actually lived somewhere in newtown and they've, they've still got all these trees lining the road and he knew that his house was number 14 or 14 trees or something like this but it just shows you how dark it was john hedges um mentioned at the top i remember him telling me as well he could remember opening his front door and looking outside and he says if it wasn't for the fact it had been raining earlier um there you could see the road because it was wet there's a little bit of a shine on it but he said if not you wouldn't have been able to see the road you wouldn't have seen anything and another one of those wartime posters some of them were a bit comical but um they got the point across as you can see here um nancy warland that's another example she said well it wasn't very nice and i remember that my mother aunt and i went to visit some friends and it was very dark when we came out of their house and we were just stepping off the curb when my mother bumped into a car it was just standing there and her glasses fell off and we just couldn't find them anywhere and you can see um uh, more posters with these catchy little headlines look out in the blackout and on the other side until your eyes get used to the darkness take it easy look out in the blackout one of the worst examples that i read about happening was um somewhere on um, coming into london a, a, a train full of passengers and the train had stopped short of a station on a viaduct and the one of the passengers thought that was time to get off the train he opened the door and stepped out that was reported in the sketch look the daily sketch a man was taken badly injured to hospital at hillingdon middlesex early yesterday after stepping from a train and falling over an 80-foot viaduct near Denham, Buckinghamshire, in the blackout. The train was stopped by a signal when the man, telling another passenger that he had to change at Ryslip, and suppose that that was the station, stepped from the carriage. So they, they tried to make it a little bit safer for people, and one of the ways they did that was painting white lines on things, uh, particularly hazardous things, so like lampposts and trees that might appear in the pavements or you can see on the right hand side here painting the curbs white and this obviously must have made some some small difference here we've got a view you should recognize this is colchester this is um, where the high street queen street comes off the high street um, on the left hand side that was of course where the tourist information center used to be but if you look in, in the image look you can see first of all you can see people carrying their gas masks everybody carrying their gas masks and if you look at the tree over here outside all saints church you can see that's been painted there's a lamp post here been painted another lamp post here been painted and if you look on the curb you can just about make out some of the white markings there as well another thing that um people had to know what was going on was when what to do when the siren went 
when there was a threat of an air raid. And um, it all depended where you lived. Um, if you if you lived in the towns, you'd have one of these big air air raid warning um, motors here. Look, you can see perched on top of a hole here, which which would boom out all over the area. I mean, there was one up apparently near Drury Road off Malden Road, and someone who lived virtually next door said, "Oh my goodness, when that went off, it was so loud." But if not, if you lived in the country, um, you might have somebody like you see on the right hand side going around blowing a whistle or something like this. One thing that the population were not sure of was information. In fact, there was information overload. The leaflets were coming through letterboxes left, right and centre. How to do this, how to do, you know, so, you know, people had all the information they needed uh, as to what they needed to do. The time went on, they um, started thinking about air raid shelters. Now, if, if you had a cellar or something like that, that was all well and good, but many, of course, people didn't. And this picture shows um, Anderson shelters. These are prefabricated corrugated iron shelters. They're being delivered en masse in a street here. Of course, you had to have a garden to have one of these, but these um, will be put up in, in the rear garden. If you, if you earn something less than about £3.50 a week or something like that, the government will give you one. But if not, they had to be paid for. And I, I've spoken to many um, people who were former scouts, for example, and they used to go around helping many of the elderly people put these together. But they would go in the back garden, um, as depicted here on both sides. And, and the idea was to semi bury them in the garden, if you like, so that maybe half of them were buried. And if you couldn't bury them, you piled up the soil so they looked as though they were half buried, if you like. And I know some people actually planted vegetables and things like this on, on top of these. But the main thing with these Anderson shelters, you weren't trying to um, make yourself safe if, if you were going to suffer a direct hit, obviously, because that nothing you could do would do that. But most of the damage, most of the accidents uh, and people who got killed was from blast damage. So when a, a bomb drops somewhere, it's not just all right. The where the bomb drops, that's going to be utterly destroyed. But the blast caused by the bomb can travel 100, 200 yards or more. I mean, if you think of Japan in the second, in the end of the Second World War, these blasts went 20 miles or more in all, all directions. So it's the blast, and the blast was was powerful enough just to pull houses down. So the thing was to to get below ground if you could. That would be the ideal way. And again, these, these had to be up, these shelters had to be up by a certain time. This is a, an, an old Anderson shelter in a Colchester garden, which I photographed some time ago. This is the doorway, and if you open the doorway, you go down some steps, and at the bottom of the steps, you turn right, and there's your little Anderson shelter type thing. Now, this might be a sort of homemade concrete one, but um, you can clearly see this bit is below ground look. And that's the bit that's above ground. So you'd have a couple of little benches maybe here, maybe a few candles or something like that. But but you'd be you'd be below ground if 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 there was a bomb drop nearby, um, and it would help you. Another one that I I came across this not that long ago, just a couple of three years ago in Old Heath. Um, someone told me that they got an air raid shelter in their garden, and again this is another little Anderson shelter. Um, and um, you can see air raid, they've written air raid shelter on it. It was a bit difficult getting in, but inside, there it is inside. And um, you, can, you can see sort of like a corrugated roof with brick, a bit rubbishy. But what I did see on these, uh, on these roof panels here, I noticed that the people who were obviously sitting maybe for hours in the shelter, had drawn these lovely pictures of aircraft and battleships and things like that. And they're still there today. And there's an example, I um, hope you can see those clearly, the aeroplane at the top and a battleship or something at the, the bottom there. And there's several more. So I, I hope they are preserved in some way because um, they're quite, quite unique. This is uh, an example about blast I was telling you. This is Ballum in London. And what's happened here, a large bomb has dropped in the middle of the road and it, it's created this massive crater that this double-decker bus had just fallen into. But the blast has blown the, these houses, the front of these houses has been blown away. So that, that's just an example of blast damage, which was the accounted for most of the damage, I think. 
Um, here we've got a, a bombed house. So obviously the house has taken a direct hit. If you're inside the house, you may not have survived. But if you were out in your Anderson shelter in the garden, as depicted here in this picture, you may have walked away. On the right hand side, again, I, I remember interviewing a, a gentleman from Crockleford, just outside Colston, right out of the sticks there. And he said, we used to, used to go down in the ditch in the bottom of the garden. Again, it's getting below ground. That's the trick if you can. And that's what all these people are, um, are ducking down in a ditch here. The time went on, they, um, obviously Anderson shelters were only useful if you had a garden. If you didn't have a garden, they eventually came up with this uh, other indoor shelter called a Morrison shelter. And most of them were like you can see depicted at the bottom here. They were, um, had a large iron top uh, with a, a very stout iron frame. Again, these had to be assembled. If you had a man around the house, um, or someone could help, but don't forget many of the men were away at war. So again, the scouts or other people would help people assembling these together. And they were very strong. And they had a wire mesh along the front and, and you know, up to three or four people could actually get inside and sleep there. And certainly it's going to be a great protection if the house gets hit and roof timbers or anything come down, you've got a bit of protection. And they also brought out a double decker one, um, which you can see on the other side. But they offered real protection. Again, we've got a picture here of a, a house that's taken a direct hit, been totally destroyed. But look what they found downstairs in the house, a, a Morrison shelter. Um, now, I don't know whether that was being used at the time, but that has, seems to have survived more than some of the brickwork. So if people were in there, they may have walked out alive after that devastating um, bomb damage. Now, if you didn't have a, an Anderson shelter, if you didn't have a Morrison shelter or table shelter, sometimes they're called, you know, people got under the sideboard, got under the table, went into the pantry, went under the stairs, anything to try and protect yourself. Um, and you think of all the, the, the endless nights, year after year of endless sleep deprivation. We, we tend to forget, but people really did suffer. Um, even living at home. One lady I spoke to, Jackie Barber, she said, whenever there was an air raid on, my mum, brother and me would sit in a little cupboard under the stairs. And for added protection, mum used to pull the dining room table over the door. So another example. This is um, the, volun the, the local volunteer um, group, who many of them later sort of became the home guard. But um, there, this is Old Heath, there's the Old Heath Volunteer Corps or group, and they're in the photographs taken in the playground of Old Heath School, which is still there, exactly the same, of course. And you, you see many of them have got stirrup pumps um, and things like that. But if you look in the background, look, there's the air raid shelter. It's a school air raid shelter. They actually had three of them in the, in the playgrounds, but there's one of them. Um, I think you went in a door at this end, and this sort of vent type thing here. Well, it, it was a vent, but whether you could get out that way or not, I'm not sure. Now, they're not there now, they've gone. But um, just over 20 years later, this school photograph was taken, 1960-61. And in the background, the, the air raid shelter was still in place. It's not there now. Um, by the way, um, maybe of interest, this young girl here, who was named Christine Frick, went on to marry me in 1970 and we're still married so um, this is north school or north street school today and they still have three of their air raid shelters next to their um, pitch their football pitch in, next to the school playground they're not used now um, they're dangerous they reckon they've got asbestos all sorts of things they can't use them but i remember going down there and i did sort of plead please don't get rid of them these are you know, they're quite interesting historically to have these. And I did manage to get inside one a few years ago. And that was looking down inside one of these. So they're all the same. So it's, it's just rubbish now. But if you look, you can see there's a, a galley running all the way down the centre here. And, be, and because some of these, now this one wasn't quite so bad, but they only probably had four inch brickwork. Um, some of them are a little bit below ground at the bottom, they were wet, etc, etc, and the water would literally run off the walls and drain into this little sample galley at the bottom here. Here we've got an archive picture of 
um, such an air raid shelter um, with the children inside. Now this may be a bit of a stage picture. It looks like they're all studying well. They may have, they may have studied, they may not have done. Um, sometimes they were encouraged to sing songs, maybe bring games in, take turns at doing little tricks and, and things like this to, to keep people amused. And here we've got Nora Frost again. Do you remember Nora was the lady whose father died um, and when he was talking about they have to go down the cellar. Well, by 1940, she says, I was teaching at St Anne's School and we had several air raid shelters on the field there. All the children had to go in them, although sometimes some children didn't come to school if the siren had gone. In the shelters, we sang songs, told stories and played games. The children certainly didn't learn much. There was a channel running down the centre of the shelter with seats on either side. The walls just ran with water and collected in the channel. We had to keep mopping the walls with floor cloths and keep saying to the children, sit up, don't lean back against the walls. Their coats got very wet if they leant back. I remember walking from St Anne's School up to the high street just to get warm because standing in those shelters for two or three hours, you got really cold. And you can imagine if the air raid siren went off about 20 minutes before it was time to go home, you've got a choice. What do you do? Um, well, you, to be safe, you'd go down the shelter, which meant they'd have to stay there for a couple of hours, maybe. There was also always a threat of invasion. Um, and there's lots of leaflets sent out what to do um, if invasion comes and you should try and move to a place of safety. <laughs> and the post on the right hand side, um, it brings it home, it, you know, it might be you. Um, and caring for evacuees is national service. So where evacuation was, um, it was, you could choose whether you wanted to be evacuated. You couldn't choose whether you had to billet somebody take an evacuee in. That was a requirement. You had to do it. You couldn't get out of it. But um, not everybody decided that they were going to be evacuated. But anyway, many did. And this, um, this notice came out in September 1940. An urgent notice sent to all the people of Colchester, temporary transfer of the population. They didn't actually call it evacuation. This was a transfer. And this is interesting because as soon as war started in September 1939, immediately um, we had about, we, we were an evacuation reception centre for about 14, 13 or 14,000 children and, and, and mums with young children from the east end of London. And they came into St Butler's Railway Station, which is now the Colster Town Station. And from there they were bussed out into the Lexington Winstry district, there's a lot of the surrounding villages. But many of the mothers with young children were billeted in Colchester um, along Lexton Road and Straight Road Lexton and places like that. But a year, and, and of course these Londoners didn't stay long, but you know, they'd, they'd gone home within a few weeks. But a year later, now this was not long after the evacuation from Dunkirk, of course, and, and they were very fearful that, that there would be an invasion. Um, apparently the, the moon was right, the tides were right, Information from the other side of the channel suggested that if Hitler's going to invade, it's going to be now. So in September 1940, this um, notice went out and it resulted in uh, over about a three day period in mid September of about 14,000 Colchester children, um, elderly mothers with young children and, and disabled people being hurriedly evacuated, mainly to the Midland towns of like Stoke on Trent, Wellingborough. Burton, Latimer, uh, to name just a few. And this was all extremely well. I say it was well organized. It might have been well organized from our end. Most of the schools were involved. School teachers would take charge of 50 or 60 or more pupils that they went with them. They all had to march down to North Station. They were put on trains. They didn't know where they were going. They were shunted around half of England, or so according to some people, before finally arriving at their destination at night time. And then they had to go to a village hall or somewhere. And the next morning, the people of Stoke-on-Trent or wherever, who'd been totally unexpected. I mean, this is where the organization wasn't there. They didn't know that, that we were coming and that then they eventually came in and they were going, it was like a market. They were going around, looking them up and down, saying, oh, I'll have him, I'll have her, and so on and so forth. And I've spoken to several people who said, me and my brother were left, nobody wanted us, we were right at the end. 
lots of poignant memories. And I'm just going to share a couple with you in a moment. But first of all, a few images. Here we've got um, some mainly boys and a few girls being evacuated. Now, you know, to some young people, it, this may have been like a bit of an adventure. You know, didn't realise the danger. Maybe their parents shed a few tears. But um, many of them were, you see, we've got all their gas masks. But, you know, other children, you know, maybe they're eight or nine years old, maybe 10 years old, have never left their mother and father before. And now they're fretting. I mean, it's really poignant to watch. But and they were just they, they weren't taken by anybody apart from they were put on a train with everybody else. They didn't know where they were going, what the families were going to be like when they got there. And here we've got another view again with um, some looks like younger children um, all being herded together. The real babies, of course, the parents were allowed to go with them. But I'm going to share two memories. This is the first one is a lady called Joy Cardi. Now, um, she was Joy Fisher. Um, she now lives up in Liverpool, but she was born and raised in Colchester. And there's a picture of her when she was five. And she was evacuated with her um, siblings and her mother. But anyway, interestingly, it will tell. This is what she said. I remember the time when my mother, my younger brother and sister and I were evacuated to Stoke-on-Trent. And it was dark when we got there. We were all taken to a church and were given these rough camp beds to lie on. I think my mother and our next door neighbour lay down on their coats. The next day they came to billet everyone. It was difficult for us because my mother had got three small children. Nobody really wanted that. We were finally sent to a miner's house which was like one of the houses you see in Coronation Street, with a passage running down the back. I can remember him coming home from work, very black, with just his eyes showing. And we were given some money to run along to the corner shop to buy some sweets. It was impossible for us to remain there. And I remember my mother being very agitated and going along to the town hall to complain. She made a bit of a fuss and mentioned that her brother-in-law was the mayor of Colchester. So we were moved to a semi-detached house in a rather nice area. Yeah, her father was Archie Fisher and Archie Fisher's brother was Handy Fisher, who, as many of you know, was mayor of Colchester at the time. So it's not what you know, it's who you know in, in this particular case. And another gentleman I interviewed was Derek Blowers. Now we can see Derek and his younger brother, Michael, on the left now they were he was Derek on the left would have been about 10 Michael about eight, seven or eight they were evacuated together and I spoke to Derek you can see on the right in 1997 and let's see what memories Derek had he said we thought being evacuated was a big event to be quite honest whether our mother shed a tear as we departed I wouldn't know and the fact that we didn't know where we were going made it even more exciting the train left about four o'clock in the afternoon and our first stop was Cambridge, where we were allowed a little time to stretch our legs and use the toilet. We then continued with numeral unscheduled stops through, through the night, eventually arriving at Kettering. This was at midnight, midnight, and we were given a mug of cocoa and a biscuit. We were then taken to an open air school in Beatrice Road and bedded down for the night. In the morning, we were assembled into small groups, maybe 10 or so in each group, and taken round the streets of Kettering by a billeting officer, knocking on various doors and asking the householder if they would take in one or two evacuees. As far as I'm aware, nothing had been prearranged. We just turned up at someone's door. My brother and I were eventually taken in by a middle-aged couple who had no children of their own. I remember he went on to say, when they knocked on this, this apparently two or three people tried to say no, but they, they had to do it. But when they knocked on this, um, it was the lady of the house who was there. And she said to the, the billeting officer, she said, well, I'm happy to take them, but my husband has final say. And I'll ask him when he comes home at dinner time. So Derek said, we went in and she took us in and straight away she sent us down the road to a big park to play. He says, whether, whether she thought we'd get lost, I don't know. But anyway, she said, we went down to this big park and all of a sudden it hit us. My younger brother burst into tears, missing his mum. And then when he started, because I started, I burst into tears. Well, he says, we, we got over that and we made our way back to the house. And by that time, um, that was Mr. and Mrs. Coles. And uh, the father had come home from lunch and said, yeah, that's fine. He'll take them in. So they stayed there for 
for several months. I think they kept in contact for quite a while afterwards with the family. But what Derek also had, which I thought was really pleasing, he still had a copy of the letter that he'd written home to his mother from Kettering after he'd arrived at this new place. And here it is, look. It's got um, 36 words with Road Kettering, 18th of September 40. My dear mummy, Michael and I are at Kettering, staying with Mr. And Mrs. Coles. We spent the night in the school. We slept on camp beds. We had five blankets between us. I shall be writing later on. I must close now, as Mr. and Mrs. Coles are waiting to take us out. Love to mummy and daddy from Michael and Derek. So I thought that was quite nice that that term he'd retained that all these years. Now, of course, um, since the Industrial Revolution, I suppose, really, that you know, many people had left the land and working in the factories. So as time went on, we became more reliant on imports for our food. Well, of course, this, this was all going to be severely curtailed now. So the, the thing now was dig for victory posters and grow more food. And everybody was encouraged to, you know, if you have a lawn in your front garden to dig it up and put grow potatoes instead or whatever the case may be. And um, here we've got um, in Victoria's, London's Victoria Park in the East End, digging allotments in the park. And this happened in parks and open places across the country. Even the moat of the Tower of London was turned into allotment. And people were encouraged to keep animals and livestock, chickens, of course, rabbits, but also pigs. And um, they even gave instructions because many people wouldn't know how to look after a pig. But here, look, it says this is an official warning notice. Do not feed your pig tea leaves or coffee grounds, banana, grapefruit or orange skins, paper cartons, dead flowers and feathers, soda, soap, salt or brine, rhubarb leaves, glass, metal or crockery. But anyway, people were allowed to start keeping pigs and, and things like this again. And virtually everything, you know, was recycled if it could be. Paper, glass, you know, turn this raw material into war material was the slogan that went out. And here you've got an example of a massive pile of aluminium pots and pans which are going to be recycled. And of course, many will know that many garden railings and things like this were, were also taken down um, and used in the war effort to help make munitions and aircraft and, and things like that. The women, of course, um, many of the men had gone, the factory places had gone. So what they started to do was to re recruit women. Um, women were conscripted when they were 18. I've, I've spoken to two or three um, women who, when they were girls, they were conscripted. They were sent down to the technical college, which um, was on North Hill, where Greyfriars um, College used to be. Um, and they were taught how to operate caps and lathes and all, all sorts of things like that. And then they were sent off to work in the factories. Some in Colchester, some went into the Midland factories uh, or Letchworth to make Spitfires or whatever the case may be. But yes, they, and there was many of these um, patriotic um, photographs and posters circulating um, of women doing the jobs in the factories. And uh, they obviously did a, a very good job. And it wasn't just in the factories they were needed, but, um, you know, lend a hand on the land. You can't, you know, these are very catchy titles. So the Women's Land Army, where they would go out and work on the farms and help um, producing food, looking after the animals and so on and so forth. And um, it shows you um, a, a very sort of, um, I'll, I'll tell you who this is in a moment, but if you look at the girls lined up there, um, it doesn't tell the full story, I don't think, of the howling wind and the rain and the snow and the ice and the old cold early morning. But anyway, um, but I want to just share with you memories of this um, girl here. I, well, I interviewed her when she was a, a, an elderly lady named Daphne Pushman. She was born in 1926 and I interviewed her in 1998. And she was a London girl from East End. And just before the war started, her mother had died. And when war started, um, you know, as I said earlier, most of the London children were evacuated. Her father sent her and her younger brother. She was evacuated down to the West Country somewhere. Well, anyway, she didn't like it very much down there. So she got hold of her brother. She said, come on, we're going home. And she said, I'll hitch back to London. 
Well, when she got back to London, uh, her father wasn't very pleased, so didn't really know what to do with her. She was about 13 or 14 years old at the time. So she says, I decided to join the Mobile Women's Land Army. I wasn't, I wasn't sure I'd heard of that before. I'd heard of the Women's Land Army, but she said, no, there was a mobile um, division, which meant you worked, you kept moving around different farms uh, where you were needed rather than staying in one particular place. So uh, let me see if I can get her interview up and you can hear what she had to say. So you, you were accepted into the Land Army? Oh, they took anything that was fit. And then where were you sent then? Well, the first place I was sent to was a Mr. Elliot at Thorpley Shokin. I arrived on a Sunday dinner time. I'd never seen a live animal, cow, sheep, bull or anything. The first job we had to do was milking. To do that, the cattle were brought in. You had to put your arms around the cow's neck to get the chain, which you tied around the cow's neck. Then you washed the udders, sat on the stall, and started milking. Fortunately, these cows were Frisians, which have the biggest teeth there are and the easiest to milk. And I'm sure it was done purposely, but after the cattle were let out, one cow was kept behind. And uh, the next thing is they brought out the bull and serviced the cow. And that was when I realised that if it wasn't for my father, I wouldn't have been here. It was nothing to do with me killing my mother. Right. <laughs> so I was there for a couple of weeks. And another thing what the, I'll never forget being there, I was billeted with the Mrs Bonnet, French, next to Thorpe Soken, a little cottage next to Thorpe Soken Church. And at night, because we had nothing to do, there used to be a little baker's near the church, and we used to climb up on the top of the baker's, and there we could watch our spitfires turning doodlebugs round, sending them back across the water. We used to sit and cheer and clap. I've never forgotten it. Never. Were there any other girls working there with you on the farm? Oh, yes, yes, it was all over the place. But you see, I never stayed anywhere long because I was mobile. You were mobile because you didn't want to be found? That was right, That's yeah. Because after a couple of weeks, I was still billeted at Thorpe Soken, but I had to get to what is now the Colchester Zoo, then belonged to a Brigadier Underwood. And I had to be there up past seven of the morning. That was your next job? Yeah, that was my next job. And so, how did you get on there? Well, I used to, I had to bike. I had to bike. From Thorpe so couldn't I be there up past seven. And after a couple of weeks, I acquired a big old Norton motorbike. And that took me through my land army. Good. I very quickly learned how to clean sparking plugs and cross wires and... It was fantastic. Were you living at Thorpe throughout the war then? No, dear, no. No, I travelled all over England, but I did do a lot in Essex. Um, Dunmo, Saffron Warden, Tattingstone, Park Road, Lexton Road, Birch. And then after that, I moved on to Berkshire, Wiltshire, and then come back here. So when you were in Colchester doing the, doing the land army, Birch, for example, and other places, was it similar work? work? Oh, no, everything was different. I mean, at uh, Elliot's farm, I just did general farming. For Brigadier Underwood, again, something I'd never seen in my life, I had to look after the tackle of a horse called Ruby and ride it. Plus the fact, we one day we'd have Italian prisoners of war, and another day, there'd be German prisoners of war, which I had to work with. There used to be an English Tommy, two English Tommies, one each corner of the field. Well, this particular day, we was pulling sugar beet. And doing sugar beet, a horse would push, pull a harrow through the rows of sugar beet. And as I, as I was showing the Italians, you had to bend, pull, bang, throw. And as I did it, this Italian, because in them days I was out here somewhere, 
the Italian come forward and put his arm on my breast and I turned round and punched him and he was knocked out. And I was in Colchester Court for assault in the POW. Really? Yes. But you laid him out? Yeah. But um, Lady Bonham Carter ran the Women's Land Army right. and she came to court with me. Yeah, After a week or so, I was summoned to court and Lady Bonham Carter came with me. And you remember what happened when you went there? Well, it was just said that uh, what he did was wrong. I shouldn't have assaulted him. I should have gone and complained and uh, done it through the paperwork. And as Lady Bonham Carter stood up, she had a very deep voice. And she said, what is as wrong as this? There was an illegitimate child. I mean, she was exaggerating, but that was her statement. And they just cleared the court. So you were, you were let off? Oh, yes, I was back to Brigadier Underwood working with the Germans. I mean, the Italians, they were lazy devils. The Germans, it was a treat to work with them. They did uh, putting in fence posts and barbed wire, and they sung as they worked, and it was a treat to watch them. Let's move on. So, the Home Guard. Now, this is a, a sort of cartoon, if you like, but the has been made famous by Dad's Army. But um, Home Guard units were all over the country. In, in Colchester, for example, many of the factories had their own special units. And um, let's just have a look at one or two of them. This is Brackets. Where Brackets used to be down the hive. They later moved up to the Severals Lane Industrial Estate, but they had the Special Works Detachment of the Home Guard. I mean, when they first started, they probably didn't have, I mean, it looks like they've got uh, yeah, machine guns or something at the front there, but, you know, when they started, they may have had to make do with, you know, I don't know about broomsticks, but old-fashioned rifles, anything they could pick up. Many of these pictures, these group photographs, were taken at the end of the war, so this is the kind of equipment probably that they ended up with. And we know that Paxman's, again, they had several units. I know Paxman's, for example, and probably many of these firms, Paxman's had a very secret program that if they were invaded, if we were invaded, how they would sabotage the company. Um, this was top secret at the time, of course, and, um, you know, how they would um, take certain valves out, put them in upside down, all sorts of things to so they, that the factory couldn't be taken over easily by the enemy. Um, we had a special detachment of Home Guard on the Abbey Field in Colchester, where there's a whole um, block of these, um, what they known as ACAC guns, but these rocket launchers, anti-aircraft launchers, where some of them would fire two rockets, some might fire up to 14 rockets at a time. This was at night time, and, um, and I, I've spoken to several people who were involved in that. I've just got time to share with you one person's memory. And that's a man called Len Munson. Uh, Len was born in 1906. Not only did he do this, he did fire watching as well. He, I remember him telling me that every, some nights of the week he had to go up to Long Wire Street and walk up and down fire watching all night and, um, and then come home about eight o'clock. And I said, so when you got home, you had a breakfast and then got to bed, Len? He's saying, not your life, breakfast and out and do a full day's work on the farm that he worked. So, you know, and then one day a week he said we were up here. This is what he said. I used to be in the Home Guard and was put on the rockets on the Abbey Field. We did our training in an old stable, which included learning how to respond to numbers, come to attention. When it started to get dark about eight o'clock, we'd go out onto the field and get the rockets ready for firing. We worked in teams of two, and my job was to do the firing. I would get my orders from the command post and then relay this to my mate who was on the other side of the rocket, and I'd tell him to load, say, breach number two. After he'd put the rocket on, which he would have got from the heap at the back, he would report back to me, rocket two safe. And I was the only one who could actually fire the rocket after receiving a further order from the command post. When the order came to fire through, came through, I would pull a plunger to make a full circuit and away it would go. They did not make a bloody round two. Sometimes you'd fire just two rockets, other times it might be 10 or more. Excuse the language there, but that's what he said. Um, it's interesting when he said that he was the only one who could fire the rocket after he, getting a final command from the command post. And that reminds me of another tale, very quickly I'll tell you, of another gentleman. He worked at Paxman's, but he was on the, the, the rocket launchers at the Abbey Field. 
And he said, we'd all gone out, we'd, we'd all gone through our drill uh, to fire these rockets. And um, we'd, we'd loaded all the rockets up. And all we were doing, we were now waiting. There's a whole line of them, a, a, a dozen or more of these. He said, we're waiting for an order from the command post to come through to fire. And he said, we waited and waited. Now, e each of these, um, these groups were in, in charge of the groups was like regular soldiers. Um, there might be a sergeant in charge of a group of them. And we waited and waited. And in the end, this sergeant ran over to the command post to find out what was going on. And when he went in there, he must have said something, come on, when are we going to fire? And of course, what he didn't know was that uh, all the mics or whatever it was were still alive. And someone must have heard the word fire, when are we going to fire, and s fired his rocket. And then they all, de all decided they're going to fire the rockets. And all these rockets, he said, you'd never seen anything like it. They all went flying up in the air. And he said there was hell to play for that. And he, apparently the reason why they hadn't got the order to fire because there were some of our planes flying over Mark's day and they were waiting for them to get out of the way. Fortunately, nothing happened, but just another example, another little story that's probably not um, printed in you know, the official record. Um, here we've got the, the volunteer um, civil defence group um, in Old Heath Playground again. Old Heath Playground, and you can, you can see on the, on the left and in the middle here, they're practising first aid. Over here, they're, they're practising putting out incendiaries, probably, with a stirrup pump. But um, I thought at this point I might just share with you something else um, that happened in Colchester, particularly um, in Old Heath as well. And this was the massive great defence, um, not only around England, across England, which, which ran from south to north, and then there was an inner line as well, but there was a, a complete um, defensive line around Colchester in case of invasion. Uh, it was called the Colchester Stop Line. And all of these little red dots and brown dots and blue dots, they're, they're all pillar boxes or command posts, RAP posts and, and various things like that. And running all the way around, well, if you look around the north, um, on the north and west here, you've got the River Cone. So that's a natural barrier. So that was not too bad. But from the River Cone here, running across the marshes, up into Old Heath, over Old Heath, across the Wick, all the way round, right round here to join up with the river again, was a massive great trench that was dug. It was about four miles long. In fact, parts of that, they did include some ancient um, ditches and dikes and things from the Iron Age period, the Roman period. But most of it was a hand dug trench. It was about 10 foot deep, uh, about 15 foot across. And for the most part, it was actually filled with water in, in some places. Um, of the 70 plus pillboxes that scattered were scattered around this defence line, uh, about 14 or 15 of them can still be seen in various places. We haven't got time to look at them on this talk. But um, what I would just like to show you is the Old Heath section. So this is um, a, a Google view of Old Heath. So there's the River Cone. Uh, there's a, a natural drainage ditch, if you like a spring that runs down to the river there. So they made in, they dug the trench along there. This is where it crosses Old Heath Road. That's the playing field at Old Heath, and that's where the wick starts, goes right over the wick. And they dug this ditch. Um, there it is, a massive great ditch right across, um, right through Old Heath and went right over the wick and right along Beerchurch Road all the way to Lexton um, and back. And if we look at this little section of Old Heath Road, so this is where the trench that came along here, it crossed the road, it ran along here. Um, now these, these houses weren't there at the time, this is Cottage Drive, but the trench ran right through here. But all of this area here, this was an approach road into Colchester and it was completely fortified. I'm just gonna show you um, how it was fortified. Now this, we're just looking at one road, but most of the roads into Colchester, Shrub End Road, North Station Road, Mersey Road, would have had similar things. And I've, I've found this out from various sources, aerial photography, oral history, etc. But there's the, so you had the ditch to start with, you had pillboxes either side here, and many people I've interviewed were actually, because these were still here, these pillboxes, so, and they lived through the war. There was a whole row of concrete blocks down here. Now, two or three of those blocks are still there. Um, 
I recently did a book called Secret Colchester and I photographed some of these blocks so you can find out more about that in that book. They're still in some of these front gardens. There was a, a whole load of these pimple type um, pyramids blocks um, on that field. There were stone blocks, concrete blocks across the road here, Speedwell Road, also in this garden. Now in the aerial maps that were produced after the war, they only saw these ones. And if you, I remember reading in the Essex Society's transactions, um, I can't remember those names did that now, they only saw these ones, but they didn't know about these ones because they would have been taken up because they needed to get through the roads after the war. But thanks to oral history from someone who lived in this house here, I, I actually know that they were there. And here they had, across the road here, um, rail girders that were bent in half and these were sunk into special sockets in the road and what happened the the people in the home guard one of their jobs would be to take some of these out obviously they had to practice taking these out putting them back in again and I think they would leave a couple out during the day so cars could pass but yeah this was something that, that, that they got involved in all the time and I'm, the lady who lived here as a girl I'm just going to share her memories with you this is Gladys Rudd uh, Gladys was born in 1927 and she still lives in in the old Heath or more than Newtown area um, and that's where she lived there's the concrete blocks that she's talking about and they all, also went around there but anyway she says the bottom of Speedwell Road was completely blocked off with a row of concrete blocks running across the road as kids we used to play on them they were just far enough apart for us kids to leap from one to the other and just over the road inside a neighbor's garden were a couple of trenches that'd be here a couple of trenches with these soldiers in and they had these crates full of bottles with wicks attached to them like molotov cocktails that was to protect us from the enemy and on the other side of old heath road just inside the farmer's field was another long row of these concrete blocks which staggered in height bombing raids this is the last part of the talk now now um culture of course never suffered like some of the cities and some of the other towns did in the midlands it's ironic really that the children of colster were evacuated to the midland towns um because many of them have told us that when we were at stoke on trent we we stood and watched um country get hit i mean there was more action going on there than there was really in colchester but anyway the first bombing raid in Colchester that where loss of life took place was the bombing raid on Old Heath and Old Heath Laundry on the 3rd of October 1940 and um, I'm going to play an eyewitness account um, of a young girl at the time who was at Old Heath School she was at, it was dinner time when it happened and she was at home having her dinner and this is Margaret Moss um, born in 1934 I remember the day the Old Heath Laundry was here. I remember it as clear as if it was yesterday. Um, what, what this, this, my father used to go down and cycle along Distillery Lane and round the pond to Brackets. Uh, he used to leave at one o'clock sharp every day to get back to work. And the siren went at one o'clock and he said, I'm off. And, and my mother said, please don't go, Jack. Please hold on. Anyway, he said, all right. And well, with, if, within four or five minutes, there was this almighty bangs. Um, they'd hit the laundry. One went in Old Teeth Pond. They hit um, the house in Scarlet's Road where um, that lad and his mum were just going to go back to school. They were in, coming out the front door and they were killed. Another one fell on Old Teeth Hill and one in somebody's kitchen or something on, on Old Teeth Hill. And I can remember the our windows, how they didn't break. The, 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 you know, the vibration was terrible. My mother was on the floor with a kettle of boiling water in her hand because we all got down. She was trying to get us into the into that air raid shelter. And um, she was crawling around with this. She got this kettle of boiling water. And um, I don't know. I don't know whether I, I went back to school. I think I did. But I, 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 that did frighten me. That was the one, the nearest. Did you go down there later on to have a look? Um, we did, but not then. But later we went and mum, and there we saw that house had gone in, in, in Scarlet's Road. That was awful. And um, 
And of course, uh, uh, I mean, uh, that I've, there was three girls in that laundry, but if it had been an hour later, they'd have killed lots of girls because mm -hmm. loads of women worked in that laundry during the war. While we're talking about the laundry, I, another gentleman I interviewed was Fred Johnson, who was working there at the time, and he was just a few feet away when the bombs dropped. So he's probably the only eyewitness who's been recorded, but let's see what he had to say. He was born in 1902 and he says, when the first bomb dropped on the laundry, I was standing just a few yards away in the garden. I'd been picking up walnuts when I heard the plane come over. I got behind the tree and the bomb hit the boiler house. Three of the girls who worked there were killed. It was terrible. They'd been sitting on the seat where they'd been having their dinner. They were killed outright. They were absolutely burnt. Everything had been burnt off them. They looked like bundles of rags that had been burnt and scorched right through. If it had happened just five minutes later, we'd have all been back at work and been killed. It ruined the place. The girls were terrified. And my machine, what I'd been working on, was a complete wreck. Another raid um, that took place, we'll just got time to mention a couple. This was the Chapel Street area raid on the 28th of September, 1942. This was about 11 o'clock in the morning. And apparently there was no air raid warning for this one. It was a, a, a single Dornier plane. Came out, apparently being chased by a Spitfire, dropped his bombs um, and off he went and did devastating damage. Well, again, we've, we've got an eyewitness account of a, a, um, a resident who, who lives at Abbotson now, but she was at school at St John's Green School nearby at the time. And this was Joan Watson. You can see in the images, the devastation. Um, eight houses were, um, um, sorry, 30 houses were destroyed and um, about 275 houses were severely damaged with ceilings coming down and things like this and eight people lost their lives. But let's hear what Joan had to say. But the huge memory of that is there was, a, uh, we were told that we'd go under our desks if something happened unannounced, so to speak. And we went... Um, there was a huge, huge explosion, and we did all dive under our desks. Now, they were desks with the great metal legs and the lift-up lids and the inkwell on there, and we, were, we would be under there, and we found out what had happened. Um, a German plane was being chased by a Spitfire. This was all found out afterwards, and to... Um, lighten his load so he could pick up speed. He just dropped the bombs willy-nilly, although he wasn't far off the barracks that were there. And it went straight down um, from South Street, uh, Wellington Street, um, and into Essex Street, and all those houses were absolutely dropped away. Um, and it was extraordinary. If a few feet one way or the other, he'd have either hit my home or he'd have hit the school mm -hmm. and my mother was at home with my baby brother she picked him up and, th and she could hear screaming and other mothers were there at the school thinking the school had been hit but that was a very very lucky escape Good. very very lucky escape and also of course um well there's lots of stories but several people were trapped underground the houses had fallen on top of them um and uh, there was some very, very lucky escapes and brave people who tried to get them out. But anyway, we, we must move on. And um, our final look is the, which was probably the, 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 the biggest raid on the town as far as destruction of property was concerned, at least, was the air raid on Sir Buttle's Corner just before midnight on the 23rd of February, 1944, um, when it's been estimated well over a thousand, maybe up to 1,400 sticks of incendiaries were dropped on the, mainly dropped around that area there. Uh, and 1,415 or 16 or so properties were totally destroyed. The, this is the area that I'm talking about. Um, this is the taken from the centre of the St Butler's roundabout there, if you like. There's St Butler Street coming down over here. Well, originally, of course, this street just ran straight and kept on going and went up Mersey Road. But there's St Butler's Church. Um, some of the buildings, this building here, which used to be Luckings, um, survived. Little building next door survived, but all of these ones here, most over this side and here, were totally destroyed. There, there's a, an archive view, if you like. Um, 
so there's that Luckings building, shall we say, That's, that was okay. Um, this was Bloomfield's ironmongery shop. You can see the big kettle, that was totally destroyed. He also had a big furniture shop right over the other side, that was destroyed. Cheshire's china shop was destroyed. Over here, this is the wall pack in that had to be pulled down. Um, here we had Griffin's furniture repository, that was totally destroyed. Um, shops up here, also totally destroyed. Um, if we just have a close look at those, Moore and Roberts and this shop here, they were totally destroyed. Um, that survived, that's where Allen's the Butchers is now, so that survived. But it was a, it was a terrible, terrible thing. Um, there's Cheshire's chart. So this is the, there's Lucking shop again, that's Bloomfield store. You can just see Cheshire's, that's Cheshire's China shop. And so this is the, this is the scene. Um, this is, we had two large clothing factories, Hollington's and Leanings. Uh, both of those completely destroyed. This is Holling, the burnt out shell of Hollington's here. Um, you can see, and don't forget, all the floors had heavy machinery. They all, everything just collapsed. You can see St. Buttles Church amid all the smoke and in the next day. Um, this is Osborne Street, where it comes out here. This is going up towards Mersey Road. Um, here we've got the, from the Britannia Works, it's where the car park is now. That was half destroyed. But we're going to finish off by listening to an eyewitness lady who was actually living. You see the footpath here? Well, Luckings is about here. Next to Luckings was a chemist. And this lady here lived in the chemist with her father. Her name um, was Edith Moss. Um, so she was actually looking from here. And um, she was um, born in 1905. She was working for the Red Cross at the time and she was about to go on duty to the hospital. But on that particular night, um, she obviously didn't go. But let's um, hear what she had to say. Now, one of the worst times, it must have been in February 44, when St. Butler Street yeah. area got mm. bombed. Yeah. Mm. Can you tell me everything you can remember about that night? Well, I was uh, um, part-time on the first aid post at the Essex County Hospital. And there was a ruling that um, we went. Oh no, it was, we we used to have to turn out when the siren went and report. Well, this particular night it went just before midnight. I was in bed on the second floor, and my father was in bed up the floor above us. And we heard this thing come along, and then he called out to me. Um, the front's the light, I said yes, and so is the back. And with that, we scrambled out of bed and we finally went up into another shop up the, further up the street um, because it was so hot you couldn't bear the heat from the flames. Because the, uh, there was uh, the fruit shop opposite us, that was burning, more Roberts burnt down, and then across on the other side of Osborne Street. Uh, Blumfield's furniture shop went up. Um, we had three dud incendiaries on our garage. And then um, uh, Cheshire's went up, the china shop. Blumfield's, the ironmongers, and practically the whole round that corner. And I remember Mr. Sam Blumfield rang up and he said to me, uh, what is happening down there? And I had to tell him that I was very sorry to say so, but both these shops were going up. And yet his son, John, I expect you know John Longfield, don't you? Know? He was living in Trinity Street and he didn't know anything was going on. He slept through it. So you said that your shop had caught fire? Yeah, the, um, all the paint was blistered, even inside the sitting room of the shop, inside the window, all the top was blistered. The windows were all cracked, the shop windows were cracked, but nothing else caught fire. It sort of, um, it stopped before it got to Luckings. What about the big clothing factories? That went up, Hollington's. Was the whole sky a mass of flames? 
It was a glow, really, just a glow. So I, I didn't report that night to duty. I've got enough duty to do where I was. What did they, what did they do to try and put the fires out? Uh, I can remember that the lights all went out, and I can remember somebody um, coming to the shop with a tin hat on, and he turned out to be a fellow I knew from the electric light works, and he'd come to make sure that all the um, uh, electricity was off, and then the gas people came and made sure that was turned off. It was, it was a muddle, really. What about the fire brigade? Well, I can't remember much about them, but they must have been about there somewhere. Must have been, because of the... It was a basket of incendiaries that was dropped, wasn't it, on that corner? Were many people congregating looking? There were quite a lot of people about, but then the police started dispersing them, because it wasn't safe, you see. So you and your father had evacuated by this time? Yes, plus the cat. We went up to a shop hour up the road, wrapped the cat up in... I grabbed the... Um, we'd got a, a red velvet tablecloth, I can remember, and I wrapped the cat up in that and took him up the road. Can you remember what the shop was that you went to? Yes, a fish shop. French's fish shop. And what did you do after that? Did you stand out and well, when knock it, what was going on? Or? And no, not really. We, after it sort of subsided a bit, we were told that we could go back again. It was safe. So we came back. And I can remember the next morning, my father standing on a pair of steps and dusting every single bottle that was in that shop. I think he was, he was in a state of shock, really, because he was automatically doing it. And then on the Sunday morning, he just collapsed in church. Finally, of course, on the 8th of May 1945, the war in Europe finally came to an end, the E Day, uh, and there was great celebrations all over the country. And just a few months later, in August, um, the war in the Far East um, came to an end when Japan surrendered. And my final slide um, shows an end of war street party. Uh, this is Old Heath. Um, this is the residents of Foresight Road and Speedwell Road getting together, but parties like this were put on uh, not only across Colchester, but across the whole country. So we're going to finish there. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the presentation and uh, thanks for watching. <laughs>